so much. Yeah, glory, glory, glory. Yeah, hallelujah. I tell you, mm, well, praise the Lord. It has, it has, uh, it has turned a little bit, a little bit warm, hasn't it? Oh, uh, is anybody in here? Are y'all hot like me? I'm just sweating up a storm, man. Tanya, turn that thing down to like freezer or something or another. I'm seriously I'm like, man, I'm already wet. But anyway, but it won't matter anyway. But uh, we praise the Lord. I, how many of you have, um, have gotten something from the first couple of messages of this series about the best day ever? Has it touched you in any way? Has there been any encouragement uh, in your heart about that? Because that's really what it's all about. I, I believe the Lord wants to encourage us concerning um, what, what happens next. Because we understand that we're in a very declining world. We understand and we've been sensing it for some time that there is tremendous um, uh, prophetic issues that are going on. And anytime you listen to anyone that even remotely deals with anything to do with the signs of the times or where we are in the, in the spiritual realm of life, uh, they always indicate that, that they have a sense and, and I know we do. If you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, 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 you must have a sense that um, things are winding down and they're, the prophecies and the word just full of information about it so that God would have us prepared and ready for what comes next. And I've just found in my life that there are some people that are concerned, even Christian people, about the fact that they that the Lord may come quickly and they won't get to live their life as if that was going to be really triumphant here on this earth. Like this earth is the best thing going. And I just want to say to you, according to the word of God, now, this is not a dream and this is not some kind of vision about something, that the word of God basically says that this is the torture rack that we're in. That this is as bad as it's going to be for a child of God that heaven awaits us and all kinds of rejoicing and so forth. And so I, I, I felt the Lord kind of speak to my heart about, hey, uh, get in here and let's see what the word has to say about what heaven is really going to be like and what we're going to be like and what awaits us and um, what are some aspects of our life that are going to just be totally different that we can be encouraged by to, to know that when Jesus comes and, and takes us home, that an event we call the rapture, the great uptaking, the gathering up, that it's going to be the best day that we've ever had because everything comes alive once Jesus comes and gets us. It, 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 he redeems uh, all that has been lost. And we've been using as a starting point, jumping off point, Luke 21. And Luke 21 is Jesus speaking about uh, what, times, uh, what the times are going to be like before he comes in a cloud, uh, the rapture, and then what we need to do about this. Let, let's just begin reading at verse 25. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars... And on the earth, by the way, I haven't said anything about the sun, moon, and stars specifically like I have some of these other things. And it's not because there aren't tremendous things happening with the sun, the moon, and the stars. I, I'm just not really an, an astronomy kind of a person. And, and um, I, I, there are just so many things happening with all kinds of signs and, and events happening in the stars and the sun that have never happened or that it's been many thousand years since some of these things happened and things line up. And anyway, there are just a lot of things that happen with the sun, moon, and stars. I, I, I just don't happen to be, uh, that's not kind of my field, and, and I'm, I'm, I don't know as much about it, but, but they certainly are. And on the earth, distress of nations. Are the nations distressed? Yes, they are. With perplexity, which means there's no answer. The seas and the waves are roaring. The people are disturbed, restless nations and restless uh, uh, oceans of people, uh, prophetically speaking, waves and sea are people, nations and groups. Uh, verse 26, men's heart failing them from fear, uh, uh, phobia, from, from terrorism. Uh, Jesus is talking about uh, terrorism in these last days and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, not only what's happening, but uh, uh, the anticipation of, of what might happen and certainly growing events of what might happen. And as, as evil just begins to uh, prevail itself more and more and more. Verse 27, 
Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud, which is the rapture with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. So Jesus said it's not going to take long. Once these things begin to happen, it's not going to take long for them to come to a conclusion. In other words, it's not going to take a thousand more years or hundreds of more years for all this to, to come to fruition. He said once you see these things begin to happen, you get your eyes off of the world, get your eyes off of the evil that is here and, and lift up your head and keep your eyes up looking for him because your redemption is right around the corner. And by redemption, Jesus is talking about to be bought back. Now, I, I know we use the word redemption all the time and we, I think, prob rarely think of what it actually is saying to us. But what Jesus is saying here is that uh, there are some things about us that have to be redeemed. Now, we know that our soul has been redeemed and that our life has been redeemed by Jesus on the cross. But are there other things that need to be redeemed? Why, well, sure there are. You say, what other things? Well, the things that were lost in the Garden of Eden. You know, when God created Adam and Eve, he, he, he gave them the whole package. I mean, they had a perfect bodies, and if they hadn't sinned, their bodies right now would be the same as they were the day they were created, with no sickness, no weakness, no aging, no anything. They got perfect bodies. And then they were created in a garden called Eden, which means delight, so they were actually created in a delightful place intending that the pleasures of that place that they would enjoy forever and the pleasures of their life, the pleasures of their existence, the, the things that, that make them happy and joyful, they could experience those forever. And then today we'll be talking about the authority that they had, which may sound a little bit dull, but um, it's a major part of our life right now the authority that we have in Christ. Well, they had all authority. They were the rulers of everything. God gave them control of the entire earth, 100% of everything, not only spiritual authority, but physical authority. They had 100% authority in the garden, but when they, when they sinned, they not only lost what they had, Mankind lost everything that God intended for us to live in. And when Jesus comes back, he's going to bring back the redeemed version, the bought back version. When God created us, we belonged to him. Um, he brew life into us. We reflected his image. Everything about God uh, we were full of, we, we belonged to him. He created us. We, owe, we owed him our life. He, he was our God. And then when we sinned, of course, obviously, we lost. We, we, we turned it over to the enemy. And now Jesus has bought it back, which is what redeemed means. And when he comes back, he's going to bring a, redeem, a redemption back with him of all the things that we lost in the garden. And, and uh, so Adam and Eve, let's talk about authority real quick. They had a total authority. And I want to give you three truths concerning our authority. What does the Bible say about our authority? Uh, number one, we were created to rule. Human beings were created by God to rule on this earth. As I mentioned, when God created Adam and Eve, he really only gave them one command, right? You remember? It's in Genesis chapter one, uh, verse 27, 28, right off the bat, first chapter of the book. Uh, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female, Two sexes. <laughs> I thought I thought I'd mention that, you know, because <laughs> there's a lot of question nowadays about, about it, right? Yeah, I just thought I'd mention it to you because, uh, you know, uh, I, did you ever think that we would get here where we are? <laughs> did you ever, did you ever think that you would ha you ever hear a preacher have to tell you that there are only two sexes on this earth, male and female? No matter how many <laughs> blanks there are and check marks there are, there's only two. You are either XX or you're XY, and that's what you'll always be, no matter what you do to yourself, you're XX and y, XY. All right, and the male and female, he created them. Next verse, verse 28. Then God blessed them. Here's the only, here's the only command that, that he gave to them besides don't eat of that tree in the center of the garden. But this was their commission, so to speak. 
Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion. Now that word dominion is a Hebrew word, rada, and it's a, it's a violent word. It means to tread down. It means to subjugate by force. It means to, uh, to, pr uh, to, to press down and, and to be violent if you need to. And, and, and so God says, all right, whatever you need to do to subjugate the earth, Whatever you need to do to be in charge of the earth, I'm gonna, I want you to do it over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And so when God created Adam and Eve, he said to them, basically, you're my kings. You're the king of the earth. I have created you to rule. I, I have given you my authority. And as you work under my authority, you can rule everything on the earth. And I want you to subjugate it. And I want you to have dominion over anything that would seek to... Uh, express its will against my will. In other words, you're in charge and I want you to make sure that everything in creation uh, operates according to my will. So they had total authority. There were, there was, uh, they were, the, they were the, uh, the, the police, they were the, the mayor, they were the governor, they were the uh, what, CIA and the FBI and Homeland Security, they were the uh, Air Force, the Army, the Navy, the Marines, and the Coast Guard. They were the President, the Congress, and you know, they were the Supreme Court. They were it all, they, they had all, had all rules. So what does this mean for me and you? Well, it means that God's intention for us is that we would have total authority in this life over everything in life, and that is who we are. That's who God created us to be. Now, I say that because today we have a theory that goes around, and believe me, it has become the major, it, it, it's not taught like a theory anymore, it's taught like a fact. But it is a theory, and it's the theory of evolution that tells us and teaches our kids that, that we are basically meaningless, that there's no purpose for our life, that we came out of some primordial ooze, and that it was almost an accident that we actually became anything. And so we don't have any real purpose to move toward. We don't have anything that says we're special at all. We're an accident, we were created by an accident, and we're going to an accident, and, and, and so there's no reason to seek for any greater meaning or purpose in life. But I want you to know that right off the bat, in Genesis chapter one, very first chapter, God tells us that we were created in his image, that he made us just like him, and we were created to rule over this earth, and that's who we really are. Now, I know that might not sound very exciting, but I'll guarantee you that all of the problems that you have in life are in your life because you don't take the authority that God has given you. You are not ruling, you're being ruled over. You're being taken advantage of because God created us and gave us this responsibility. But of course, let me, let me read Revelation chapter one. The first chapter of Genesis is of, obviously Genesis is the first book in the Bible. Let's go to the last book. Let's see what it says. In chapter 1 of Revelation, begin at verse 4. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Uh, you mean there's seven Holy Spirits? No. <laughs> no. There's seven aspects of the Holy Spirit. And if you want to know what they are, go to Isaiah 11, verse 2. And it'll list all of the all seven of the aspects of the Holy Spirit. He's the uh, he's the he's the Spirit of the Lord. He's the Spirit of wisdom, understanding, mount, counsel, might, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. So he's there. The Holy the, the 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 Holy Spirit's there. All right, verse number five. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. What is, what, what's John telling us in Revelation? <laughs> that, it, that, it, that, that God made us, and then God had to come back and wash us, cleanse us with his own blood, 
so that our life could be redeemed to what it was really intended to be all along, and that is that we would be kings and priests with God. Now, ladies, I know it might sound a little awkward for you to think about being a king, but you are according to what God says. That means you're a ruler. You have authority. And, of course, we guys, we got to get used to being the bride of Christ, so we all have something to kind of get used to, you know. We're his bride, and we're going to marry Jesus. That kind of seems a little, you know, awkward to me. But, but that's what God says, and, and it'll be fine, and we'll all get there. But we're created to be kings and priests. This just means that God's given us the ability to rule. So, you know, you may be sitting here thinking, well, uh, no, no. Uh, you know, you said, Pastor, that I'm a king and priest, and that's who God made me, and that's who I am. Well, you know, I work for a business, <laughs> or uh, I drive a bus, or, you know, I, I work at a, at a gas station. You know? Well, that's what you do for a living. That's not who you are. Who you are is a king and a priest with God. Now, I want, you hear, I want you to hear Peter say this. Peter says it in another, in a different kind of way, but I want you to hear what he says. This is in 1 Peter chapter 2, and this tells us who God created us to be. All right, listen to what Peter says. But you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. That means you're kings and priests. A holy nation, his special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him. I love this line. This is, there, you know, there are just some scripture passages in, in the word that are just so nice when you say them. It just, I just love the way it, it puts it. I, and this is one of those lines. Who, who, uh, who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. <laughs> that, I just love the way that says that. It is. Who once were not a people, but are now the people of God who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And all that's saying, it's kind of an awkward way to say it, but all it's saying is, when you didn't have the mercy of God, you were not the people of God. And when you received the mercy of God, then you became the people of God. And what that mercy did was, that mercy transforms you into what God actually created you to be, and that is a holy nation, a royal priesthood, you know, proclaiming the Lord. That's what Peter says uh, the grace of God did to us. Now, can you imagine the difference in the message of evolution uh, as opposed to what I'm telling you now about, about how the Lord created you? Evolution says, you're animals. I mean, you came from them, you're barely above them, there's nothing important about you, you don't have any great destiny, you came from nothing, you're going to nothing, and I'm saying to you that you were created in the image of God, that you're set free, and that God says that you're a royal priesthood, and you have all power and authority, and, and, and who you really are is going to fulfill you. When you, live on, when you live out the authority that God has put in you, that it's going to fulfill your life, and it's going to... It's going to matter in your life and it's going to change your life the way you, that you live right now because now we're, we're not ruling. Now we're being ruled over. Even though God has given us the power to rule, God has redeemed us and we have, at least have spiritual authority through Jesus Christ. If we don't have absolute authority, we do have spiritual authority. And, uh, but we're being ruled over right now. I mean, uh, look, look, just, just look around. It, it, doesn't take, it doesn't take hard, to, uh, to, doesn't take long to see I mean, how does the earth treat Christians nowadays? As a matter of fact, we're probably some of the most despised people on the face of the earth right now, right? I mean, uh, there was a day when that wasn't true, but now that is totally true. Christians are being persecuted all over the world now, spit on, mocked. The Bible is mocked. Christianity is mocked. God is mocked in this world. And as a matter of fact, I wouldn't be surprised that the words that I'm saying to you in a very short period of time from now would not be considered hate speech and be taken down, be fact found to be not factual. But it is factual, and God says, look, you were created to rule, and if you'll be patient with God, when Jesus comes, he's going to bring back all of that authority, and it's going to happen in the twinkling of an eye, and it's on its way right now. All right, let me give you a second fact, or second truth about our authority. Number two, you have as much authority as you are under. You have as much authority as you are under. 
the more you surrender to God's authority, the more authority you have, is what that really is saying. Let me show you, 2 Timothy chapter two. This is just, gonna, this is just a verse that I, I threw in because I wanted, just, wanted to introduce the concept of reigning with him, okay? Uh, 2 Timothy two, verse 12. If we endure, Paul said to Timothy, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, we also, he also will deny us. I, I just wanted you to see that the Bible promises us that we are going to reign, that there's going to be a future for us, and that we are going to reign over something in, 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 with God in life. And I, I, I'm just trying to introduce the fact that there, there is a further use of authority rather than just the simple use that we have on earth of taking authority over the enemy, not letting the devil beat us up, uh, using that authority to uh, help our family, help our life, move our job. We don't have to be beaten up in life is what I'm saying by the authority issue. But there is further, there is further use of it. And, and, and um, in Revelation 22, which is the last chapter in the Bible, God is talking to us about the old heaven and the old earth being destroyed and that a new heaven and a new earth is coming in its place. And on that new heaven and new earth, we're going to be living with God in, in, in our Father's house that we've been singing about so much. Let me show you Revelation 22, last chapter of the Bible, Revelation 22, verse three. And there, shall be, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads, there shall be no night there. Well, well we, don't need any, we don't need any sleep because we'll never get tired. But there's no night there. They no longer need a lamp or light of the sun for the Lord God gives them light. And look at this last little line. And they shall reign forever and ever. So Genesis, the first book in the Bible, in the very first chapter, tells us that God created mankind to have authority on this earth, and the last chapter of the Bible tells us that we are going to reign with God forever and ever and ever, and everywhere in between the first and the last, God says, use your authority, now, one thing that I can tell you by reading the Bible a lot is you don't find a lot of people using any authority that God has given them. As a matter of fact, when you study the pages of the Bible, you see very little authority even used. Adam and Eve certainly didn't use any authority in the first two chapters. When the enemy came against them, they had all authority to resist, resist that, reject that, to rebuke him, to send him away. But they didn't use any of their authority. And God intended for all of us to use our authority. And what happens in this world is the devil seems to be making a lot of progress nowadays because he seems to have a lot of authority in life. But God did not give the devil authority. He gave authority to you and me. And he said, you use your authority. And so I'm saying to you that the devil doesn't have any authority in this world and that the only authority he basically gets to take advantage of is the fact that we're not using ours. That it is unused <laughs> human authority that the devil has and he has no real power and no real authority on this earth. We, God has given it to us. But when Adam and Eve sinned, they not only sinned against God, they handed over, and I'm gonna use the word title deed. And I know that if any of you have ever studied the book of Revelation, you've heard the word title deed. And it's, that phrase is not in the book of Revelation. But the concept is that this earth has a title deed. In other words, there is a, uh, a what, what we call it, a proof of ownership. Let's just say that. That's what a title deed is. A title deed gives you the authority of ownership. If you have the title deed, you're the owner. Well, when God created Adam and Eve, the concept is that God gave them the title deed of the earth and that they had it and when they sinned, they handed it over to Satan who seduced them and he had the power, the title deed of the earth. And then Jesus comes along and Jesus has to come to this earth as a human being 
and wrestle with an enemy that has the authority on this earth because it has been given to him and get that authority back. Hey, let me just show it to you, all right? Jesus is talking about this in John 14. You know, the beautiful passage that says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me and my Father's house are many mansions. Well, at the end of that chapter, Jesus has been talking in chapter 14 to his disciples. He said, I'm going away. But don't get all worried about that because I'm gonna send another one just like me. I'm gonna send a paraclete, which he's talking about the Holy Spirit, that he's, gonna, he's not only gonna live uh, with you, he's gonna be in you. He's going to empower your life. So don't be fearful I'm not leaving you orphans is what he's basically saying I'm going to send the Holy Spirit back well then in verse 30 here's what Jesus said I will no longer talk much with you for the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me now the only reason I wanted to read that verse to you is because Jesus is acknowledging in that verse that Satan is the ruler of this world at that time now remember, Jesus hadn't gone to the cross yet. Jesus hadn't gone back to heaven. He's on this side of the cross, and Jesus is saying that, that the ruler of this world, Satan, is coming, and, 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 and he, he's going to have to be dealt with, basically what he's saying. Now, let me go to another place in, in, in Luke. In Luke um, chapter 4, you see Jesus having a confrontation with the devil. The first thing, remember one of the first things that happened in the earthly ministry of Jesus is that Jesus was, Jesus went out into the wilderness, right? To be, Bible says, to be tempted of the devil. That was the purpose of going out there. He went out there on purpose so that Satan could have a shot at him. And it says that he was there for 40 days and 40 nights. And then the tempter came to him and they started making offers to him. And one of the offers was, I know you're hungry, uh, tell the stones to be made bread, and uh, that'll be great, you can be filled. And then Jesus took a verse in Deuteronomy and said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. You know, then he, but Satan didn't, didn't quit. He, he, he took him up on the mountain and he, uh, let me go to the temple first. He took him up on the temple first and he said, all right, throw yourself off this temple because, uh, you know, God's got some angels watching you and they're not going to let you smash down there on those rocks. Uh, and boy, wouldn't it be thrilling and wouldn't everybody get fired up if they saw you just jump off this thing and before you hit the ground, all of a sudden you just kind of stopped and just kind of lightly touched. Wouldn't that be impressive? Boy, people would just go crazy over you. And, you, <laughs> and Jesus said... Another verse from Deuteronomy, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And then the last thing he did was take him up on a high mountain. Let's just read it. It's right here in verse 5. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, look at what the devil's promising here. All this authority I will give to you and their glory. For this has been delivered to me. When did this happen? When Adam and Eve sinned. Satan says, I got their authority and I got their glory. You know, the Bible says, and this is just how the word ties together in such a great way, the Roman road, which most people use to try to win somebody to faith and show them what they need to do to be saved. It starts with 3.10, verse, uh, Romans 3.10, where it says, uh, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. And then it goes to 3.23, and it says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In other words, Paul is saying in Romans that the essence of sin is a loss of God's glory that he gave you. And so here's Satan, I, I'm, I just point this out because the word is just so amazing. It's so intricate. And because Satan says that, look, I'm gonna give you all of this authority that I have. God didn't create me with authority, but Adam and Eve had it. And when I seduced them, they gave it to me. And so it's mine. So I have the authority to give to you. And I not only got their authority, I got their glory too. <laughs> Just to throw that in as a little, you know, dig to Christ. And if you 
will just bow down and worship me, I'll give you this authority back. I'll give you everything if you'll just bow down and worship me. And Jesus didn't argue a moment about it. There's no discussion about it as if Jesus would look at him and say, well, wait a minute, you don't have any authority to give and blah, blah, blah. The fact is he did have the authority because it had been delivered to him. By the, word, uh, by the way, the word, uh, the word delivered is paradidomai, which means to uh, hand over treacherously. It means like uh, in, a, in, a, in a betraying kind of way to hand something over. And Satan said, uh, this, this authority has been paradidomy, this has been delivered to me in this, in this kind of treacherous, uh, traitorous way, and I give it to whomever I wish, therefore, uh, if you'll worship me, all of it can be yours. And so sin, Adam and Eve sin, and sin is not simply a rebelling against God, Sin is actually an agreeing with the devil and handing over to the devil what God intended for us to have for ourselves. And, 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 and when you decide to live uh, unrighteously, when you, when you decide to live out from under uh, the way God created you to live and intended you to live, you, you choose, you're choosing to give the authority of your life, whatever area you're in, your, your marriage, your family, your, your job, wh whatever area you have determined that you are not going to obey Christ about, you are, you, you are not only rebelling against God, but you are handing over to the enemy the authority that goes with that area of your life. And you're not going to kick him out of that. You know why? Because you can't kick the devil out of his own territory. And rebellion is his territory. So he looks at you, you say, Satan, get out. You have no authority here. You know, Get thee behind me, Satan. Whatever words you want to use to exert authority over an enemy that's ruining your life, he's going to look back at you and laugh and say, hey, man, this is my property. This is rebellion. I live in rebellion, man. You can't kick a man off his own property. And so Jesus is talking to us about the fact that, that this, uh, this authority in life has to be has to be won back. It, it, it has to be, it has to be, uh, he has to go and receive this authority back. He can't take it from him. The devil said, I'll give it to you and thank the Lord that Jesus didn't say, well, okay, um, you know, I, that'll be fine. Um, <laughs> I'll take it back. No, Jesus looked at him and said, look, um, no, devil, I think I'll just go and die for it. Uh, you know, that's how I'm going back. I'm not taking any shortcuts and taking your way out. And so Jesus, when he died on the cross, he redeemed our authority back. And now Jesus has our authority and it has been redeemed by his blood. He has bought back our authority. So when he comes in the, and, and raptures us up, one of the things that we get back, we not only get a wonderful body back, that Adam and Eve lost for us in the garden. We not only get all the pleasures of the world that God intended for us to enjoy in, in, in all of our life and all of our existence, but we also get the authority that God has, has for us to give. Now, let me skip over to the third one here because I don't want to get too long on this. I, I can draw it out because I love this kind of stuff. I, I don't know, you know. I, anyway, uh, I know it can, be, it can be a little uh, tough on you. So let me go to the third one. Our actions on earth will influence our eternity. I don't know what kind of concept you might have of the rapture and living with God in heaven. But it, it, it seems to me, by the way, m many people talk about heaven and talk about life in heaven, that that many people don't have any concept about the fact that how you live your life here on earth right now will have some influence on your eternity. It has influence in, in, in the giftings that, uh, uh, and the gifts that you receive in heaven and, and the crowns that, that, that you lay at the feet of Jesus. And it has direct influence on what happens in the thousand year kingdom of, of God on this earth. 
Now, let me just explain this real quick because uh, uh, I don't want to get too bogged down in it with you. But here's the order of what happens. When Jesus comes to get us, he takes us back to heaven with him. Um, when we get back to heaven, we begin, I believe we begin the marriage supper of the Lamb. And I believe that during the time of the tribulation, while tribulation's going on here on earth, seven years of tribulation, we in heaven are enjoying the marriage supper of the Lamb. At the end of tribulation here on earth, there is a gigantic battle that is fought. It's called the Battle of Armageddon. And it's where all of the armies of the world have come to wipe tiny little Israel off the face of the earth. And, 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 that, and, and, and of course, Jesus is going to come down and to defend them. And he's going to take care of all the armies of the world. And the blood is going to run as deep as the horse's bridles. It happens in the Valley of Megiddo, the Battle of Armageddon. And we're going to be right there with Jesus, right there watching everything that Jesus is doing because the scripture says that we come back with him. Now, we obviously aren't going to have to come back and fight anything because it says that the Lord himself is going to do this. And we're just going to get a chance to watch the most critical uh, but most likely uh, shortest battle in the history of creation as Jesus takes care of them. Well, that's what ends the marriage supper in heaven when we have to leave and come down to earth with Jesus. He sets his feet on the earth. When he takes care of them, Immediately after the battle of Armageddon is over, on earth starts a 1,000 year kingdom of God. On this earth, a physical, earthly kingdom of God. And, 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 and the one, we saints rule and reign with Christ. Christ rules on the throne in heaven with what is called the rod of iron, which means he doesn't tolerate sin. There is no rebellion against him. It is absolute judgment and authority. And that, and that we, as his saints, rule with him over certain geographic areas in this, in this thousand year kingdom. If you've ever heard the word millennial, Millennium just means 1,000. The millennial kingdom is a 1,000 year kingdom of God on this earth that happens right after the battle of Armageddon. It's before, it's before uh, the great white throne and all of those things. It's just the next event after the tribulation. Now I'm gonna read in Revelation 19 what happens at the battle of Armageddon and what happens right after the battle of Armageddon, all right? Revelation chapter 19. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. That's, that's us. That's Jesus on the horse, and that's us. Then the beast, which is the Antichrist, was captured, and with him the false prophet. That's the anti-Holy Spirit, who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Buzzards had a field day. All right, that's the end of chapter 19. Chapter 20, it continues because I know you say, well, what about the devil? We've seen the Antichrist and we've seen the anti-Holy Spirit. What about the devil himself? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, verse 1, Revelation 20. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and, the great chain, and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold, uh, and I love this line. This is another one of those great lines. And he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should, uh, so that, uh, set, let me hang on, set a seal on him, uh, so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while, a little season. Verse four, next verse. And I saw thrones and they that sat on them that's us. And judgment was committed to them. In other words, Jesus put us on some thrones. 
and said, you have the right to, to be a judge, to rule over this part, all right? And um, then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshiped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So when, when Jesus puts us on our throne, then he resurrects all of the people in, in the tribulation who, who got saved, who came to him, who got martyred because they stood for him. And they were beheaded and they were sawn asunder and they were uh, boiled in oil and they were fed to the lions. I mean, all kinds of horrible ways they died, but the fact is they received Christ during the tribulation period. And they got resurrected, they got gifts, and then they got to, to, to come out there with us and rule like we rule. All right, now, verse five. Next verse. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So in other words, everybody that got resurrected and raptured, that's the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who is part of the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. But still, but, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now, when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, which are idioms for evil, uh, and gathered them together to battle, whose numbers as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented there day and night forever and ever. So what happens well, at the end, we get to rule and reign with Jesus Christ on this earth for a thousand years. And what is going to determine whether we rule and what we're going to rule and reign over while we're on this earth? Well, it's the way we lived our life while we're right here. If how faithful we've been. I want to give you, I want to read this parable to you because I, I'm not sure if you've ever heard the, this. Uh, and if you did read it, you might have read it and, and you thought it was uh, the parable of the... Uh, of the talents, but it's not the parable of the talents. It sounds a lot like the parable of the talents, but this is not the parable of the talents. This is a parable Jesus uses to tell you and me that what we do on this earth matters and that it's going to determine what happens uh, as far as our leadership in the end during this millennial kingdom. In other words, there'll be a reward. I want to read it to you, Luke, uh, Luke 19, verse 11. Now, as they heard these things, the disciples, he spoke, uh, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. In other words, Jesus and the disciples are approaching Jerusalem. The disciples are thinking in their mind, well, since we're coming to Jerusalem, Jesus is probably going to just go ahead and set up his kingdom in Jerusalem right now, immediately. That's, that's what, and Jesus knows what they're thinking. And so he said, all right, I need to tell you guys what's going to happen here. Verse 12, next verse. Therefore he said... A certain nobleman went, went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called 10 of his servants, delivered to them 10 minas, which a mina is three months salary. So it's a pretty good little chunk of money. Delivered to them each, so 10 servants, each one of them gets one mina a piece. All right, and here's his instructions. And said to them, do business till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we shall not have this man rule over us. And so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first saying, well, master, your mina has earned 10 minas. And he said to him, well done, good servant. Because you were faithful in a very little, have authority over 10 cities. You see what he's saying here? He's saying, all right, this is a parable that tells you about what happens after the rapture 
And he says, there's going to be a time where you are going to be called into account for what I gave you to use on this earth. Whether it's a little or a lot, whether it's everybody gets the same or some people are more gifted, more talented, um, better equipped, whatever it might be, that's not the issue. The issue is God gave you something when he created you. He gave you gifts. He gave you talents. He gave you abilities. He gave you a mind to work with. He gave you a body to use. Some people's bodies are stronger than others. Some can work longer. Some people's mind work better. We all have different categories and usage, but the fact is God gave all of us something to use for his glory. And what this parable is saying is there's going to be a day of accounting one day where when you get there, he's going to look at you and say, what did you do with what I gave you to do with? You're not going to be judged based on what he gave me. I'm going to be judged on what he gave me. You're going to be judged on what, uh, on what he gave you. And don't get me wrong, this is not a punishment judgment. This is not like a, you're going to go to hell and all that. No, this is a judgment of rewards. It's like an Olympic judge looking at you perform and then saying, okay, that's a nine. Oh, that's a 9.3. That's, you know, and you receive rewards based on that. But there's going to be an accounting and it's going to be based on what you did. And, and if, you, if you used well, he said, you might be ruling over 10 geographic cities in the millennial kingdom. You, know, you might be the dog catcher. I don't know what, you know, it just depends on what you've done with what God gave you to do with. And then there was another one and he, and, and he had five and he, the second came saying, Master, uh, your mina has earned five minas. And likewise, he said to him, you also be over five cities. Then another came saying, Master, here's your mina which I kept and put away in a handkerchief. For I feared you because you are an austere man. That means a severe man. Uh, you, you're you're kind of unstable. Uh, you collect what you did not deposit and you reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, out of your own mouth, I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man, collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank? that at my coming I might have collected it with interest. And he said to those who stood by, take the mina from him and give it to him who has 10 minas. But they said to him, master, he has 10 minas. In other words, they're kind of objecting. They're saying, why, why do you, this one already has 10. That, that doesn't seem to be fair. And he said, well, he stewards well what I gave him. So give it to him. Um, for I say to you that, to everyone who has will be given, and, uh, and from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. But bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. Pretty drastic, right? So you know it's not the parable of the talents, right? Because everybody got a different number of talents and they produce differently. This is, this is altogether different. But what I want you to see here is that God holds us accountable for what he has given us in our life. And so what happens to us in eternity is influenced by what life we live on the earth right now. Now, I'm not telling you that you're gonna go to heaven if you do real good. And if you don't, you're not going to heaven. You don't go to heaven by doing good stuff or not doing good stuff. You go because of your relationship with Jesus Christ. So this is not a reward as to whether you don't make it or do make it. It's a reward of what happens to you there. When you do make it, what kind of, what kind of rewards, what kind of uh, uh, assignments, what kind of authority uh, are you going to be given in eternity based on what you did with what God gave you to do now? So what I'm saying actually now is, what are you doing with your mina? I mean, are, are you, have you buried it? Are you using your mina? That's what God gave it to you for. He gave it to you so you could use it. And so it, it, if there was ever a time to use it, 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 I'm telling you, it's now. Now's the time. You better get off that mina and, and, and start using that thing or else uh, there's going to be an accounting one day. And, it, it, you know, I don't know about you, but when I stand before the Lord, I don't want to hear done or half done, you know, or uh, I want to hear well done, my good and faithful servant. 
because God, I mean, God deserves that from me. I don't know if you think about things like that. Look, Jesus gave himself for me. He gave me life. I owe him my life. He created my life. He empowers me now. He protects me. He provides for me. And, and, he, uh, and he deserves all that I can do for the rest of eternity. And this is just an, uh, some information about our authority. We have limited authority at the moment. We have spiritual authority through him, the Holy Spirit in power in our life. We can rebuke spiritually. We can work spiritually. We can walk spiritual and spiritual authority. But one day we will have complete authority, both physical authority and spiritual authority because Jesus has redeemed that and is going to bring it with him. All right? All right. Let's bow our heads with you once again.